Hi, this is Roger, thanks for dropping by. I'm going to go through the um, questions and answers. So, same format as we did last time. Questions have been left under a single video. And I will read the question out and try and pronounce the channel name who left the question. Don't forget these are channel names, not individuals' personal names. They're the names of the channels of the uh, people who've left the question. And then I'll do my best to answer them. Um, We'll see how we get on. Bit of fun, although it's actually quite serious because obviously I'm at, when there's a question that's asked by one person, it's now being asked by, like, the world. <laughs> so I'll do my best to get accurate answers and everything. If I don't know, I shall say so. Right, question one then is Illo Clion, I think that is. Um, when you wrap a bit of moss around your telumnia, Columbia's to get them started on the mount. How long do you keep the moss on? Do you remove the moss to see whether the roots attach and place it back if they haven't? Or is it just a feeling you have? Um, thanks for the opportunity and your time. Right, mounting Tolumnias. First thing, to, most important thing with Tolumnias, they're twig epiphytes. They grow on twigs. So they don't tend to grow on branches and trunks like many other orchids. They're growing on twigs. Therefore, they're growing on nothing. Yeah, their roots are effectively bare. They don't. They don't grow in things. They grow on twigs and very small branches, and that's quite important for their general well-being. They don't like the base of the plant wet. They just. That's not how they work. They need the base of the plant to be dry. So if you're going to put them on a mount. Um, <laughs> As long as the base of the plant isn't in the moss, it's all right for the roots to be in the moss because being on a mount, that's going to dry daily, isn't it? So they're not going to stay wet. And that would reflect the way they grow in the wild. They get their moisture mainly from the early morning dew. And often that's the only moisture they get, apart from they tend to come from coastal regions and islands in the Caribbean. So they've got moisture in the air constantly, sea breezes and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, um, now that I've started using live moss, oh, hang on, we've got to do one cat in and one cat out, I think. Come on then, sort yourselves out here. Nope, one's staying out and one's gone out. Right, and then you can stay out, both of you. Um, right, <laughs> we'll get to. Yes, so if you're going to plant them on a mount, they're in a, almost in an ideal world. They don't need a lot of moss, they just need something to help keep the roots hydrated long enough for the plant to absorb the moisture before the moss dries out. So daily would be nice. Um, they will grow inside a little clay pot with no media at all. They're just attached to the clay pot. They don't need to go in stuff. Um, and now that I use live moss, I don't tend to mess about taking the moss off and having a look at the roots and things like that. I just put the moss on there and let the plant do its own thing. When I used to use the zombie moss, um, that moss can go off even on a mount and become quite acidic when wet. Now, okay, it dries out, but then you wet it, it the acidity straight back again. So that's Tolumnias. Try to keep their the base of the plant, try to keep that out of any media. Right. Um, Megan Fletcher, I have heard that orchids with more exposed roots, you should pre-moisten the roots before feeding to avoid, to avoid root burn. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm just having to think of the orchids in the wild sitting on their tree and Mother Nature coming round, sending in the first rainstorm to moisten the roots and then the second rainstorm to wash down the feed. What do you think? <laughs> Firstly, the root burn is normally caused by the feed being too strong or a too high a cult, uh, uh, um, chemical element that's this is just not not right, not balanced, and anything like that. Um, also, the times you may get root burn is if you've got bare-rooted plants in bright light, like sunshine. Yeah, and what's happening is that the, the you're feeding your plants, 
and the, the water is evaporating and possibly leaving some of the chemicals in a stronger form than you originally put it on there. But under normal circumstances, if you're using your fertilizers correctly, it shouldn't burn the roots. And probably whatever strength is recommended, you can get away with half or a quarter of that. <laughs> and certainly if it's not specifically for orchids, you really need to cut the strength right down. And I'd recommend using a TDS meter and not believe what it says on the packet because they're often miles out. Um, I have had root burn and I put that down to bright light, a little bit too strong and the type of fertiliser involved, which is a controversial point, but I don't care, I stick my, net at, I stick my neck out. There is only one fertiliser on the market that I know of that has a high content of sulphur and that's the rain mix yeah for our own water and it has a very high percentage of sulphur in it and sulphur burns it's the only one I know that's gone down that road and I was using that when I got some root burn could be coincidence but as I said controversial point I don't want to run a good product down um, and it was only on bare-rooted plants that I had the problem, but, you know. Anyway, that's that one done. Uh, where are we? Um, Wander Shore. That's not a place, that's <laughs> the channel name. <laughs> We're not down on the beach. Um, hello, Roger. I have a BLC Taiwan Chief Wine. I've had almost three years. Potted in medium orchiata bark and a wholly glazed clay pot. I could see it had bloomed previously, but no blooms for me so far. I have it under grow lights and I feed and water regularly. Do you have any advice on what else I could do to get it to bloom? Firstly, when you say it has bloomed before, you've heard me talk about a large plant with three or four spikes on and the nursery's cut it into six pieces and one of the pieces you've got has a spike on it. That doesn't mean the plant's blooming size. It was before it was chopped up. So the first thing I'd recommend doing is having a look at the size of all of the pseudo bulbs. And if they start with itty bitty ones and gradually get bigger and bigger, then it's been grown on from a seedling. In, in which case it won't have bloomed before. You'll be the one. So. If it's bloomed before, it could still be a division which has reduced its size and strength and its ability to bloom, if you see what I mean, okay? And if you've got it under grow lights, I mean, I, um, it sounds like it's in a reasonable media, it sounds like it's in a reasonable environment, it sounds like everything's okay. So the only thing I can think of is if, it's, if it has bloomed before is that it's a division off a blooming sized plant and it has yet to get back to blooming strength which is for different cattleyas it's a different size and it'll be a different number of pseudo bulbs all with leaves on that actually determine the excess energy in that unit of plant that says I've got enough spare to bloom and if it hasn't got enough spare to bloom it'll grow another growth produce another leaf uh, leaf and produce some more roots and then it'll assess again have I got enough spare energy to produce blooms and that's how it'll go on until it has so um, the other thing you could do is if you've got it growing under lights you could try increasing the length of time it's under the lights don't get it too close to the lights to increase the light because they can burn those lights but um, try increasing effectively the day length the length of time it's under the lights if it's part natural light and part artificial lighting, the same would apply. Try getting it up to, say, 14 hours, yeah? The other thing is also try a drop in the night temperature. That can sometimes trigger cattleyas into bloom. Depends what's in the mix, really. <laughs> so some ideas there. Um, sometimes it's just the plant is not strong enough as a unit to actually bloom. And that's a difficult thing to assess. Right, an odd question. This is Clementina Garrido. An odd question. Looking for a conservatory like yours for my orchids. What's the best, glass or polycarbonate? 
aluminium or PVC. Of course there's a price question, but what I would like to know is more in the life expectancy field best results for my orchids environment. Um, thank you in advance. Well first of all I've never bought a conservatory so I know nothing about the prices of them. Um, when you say PVC most construction units now would be UPVC and the beauty of that is it's pretty strong and it's virtually maintenance free and can last well possibly as long as you. Uh, as far as maintenance go a white with a cloth now and again you know, it really is, you know, it doesn't flake, it doesn't peel, it doesn't do anything daft, it just sits there doing its job. The downside is it's normally white, which some people find a little bit stark, harsh, whatever. But good um, lasting properties, um, pretty good strength involved there, and virtually maintenance free apart from a wipe down with a cloth. Aluminium I know nothing about because I've never had one. Wood, maintenance. Heavy on the maintenance front. <laughs> and also, it ain't going to last forever, as you saw in my previous one that was almost falling down. Right, um, glass or polycarbonate. Um, if you buy a UPVC conservatory, you are highly likely to get glass double glazed units as part of that structure. The double glazing would help, will help with your insulation and all that sort of stuff, that's good. Polycarbonate can be good for insulation as long as it's thick enough and the air gap between the two pieces is big enough. And you can get triple skinned polycarbonate. Polycarbonate has the benefit of if somebody chucks a brick through it, it's relatively easy to, to replace and you haven't got a lot of mess to clean up. It bounces, it's, it's not quite difficult to break. Um, but then, you know, who's going to be throwing bricks at your uh, conservatory? Um, glass is nicer to look at. Polycarbonate is pretty good on the roof because it gives you some protection from the sun. Um, but you will lose your heat in the winter time, if that's a problem for you, through the roof more than anywhere else. And polycarbonate, if it's not, hasn't got a big enough air gap or is, isn't tripled skinned it's going to lose you some heat through the roof. Um, you won't get a conservatory nowadays with a glass roof because the strength of the glass required for the building regulations would cost more than the conservatory because it would have to be plate. <laughs> so uh, there you go, some thoughts. As I said I've never bought a conservatory so I've never looked into it that much. Right, D Maxwell which method, methods do you suggest for changing orchids from mounts to pots with the least amount of root shock? That would include recommended media and timings, etc. Um, huh. Well, first of all, it's on a mount, yes. Is it in moss or is it just on the mount bare rooted? Has it got a lot of moss? Has it only got a little bit? Are most of the roots in the moss or hanging out the sides and have become aerial? So first of all, look at your plant on the mount and decide what, what we're dealing with here. Now, if most of the roots are aerial on the mount, they are probably going to be a, object to being put in any sort of media, whatever it is. But the more open and airy it is, and the faster the water goes through and drains, the better because it's the change of media that's normally the shock, apart from ripping the roots off the mount if they're well attached. Um, yeah, so try and minimise the drasticness of the change. Now, if it's on a mount with a lot of moss and the roots are in the moss, you could take it off the mount and put, and put it straight in a pot full of moss. No shock, apart from the disturbance of the roots ripping them off. Yeah, And perhaps that moss could have some bark in it, like half and half. I'll acclimatise it to, I'm still in my moss, but there's some lumpy stuff in here as well. We'll we won't worry about that. And then next time round, reduce the moss if you want it to end up in pure bark. Um, taking it off a mount and putting it in inorganic, something like Lekka or something like that, is probably going to be too much of a shock. But um, anyway, the, 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 the main concept is minimise the difference between where it was and where it's going. And the next thing is get the timing right. And the best time of all is when new roots are growing, which 
normally coincides with either some new growth maturing or some new growth starting somewhere around there. But trying, try and have new roots on the plant because they haven't acclimatized to anything yet. So they'll go in whatever they're given because they know no different. And that's the important bit. Right, where are we now then? Oh, have I got to say that? <laughs> and the next channel name is Girls Get Jealous. Well, so do blokes. <laughs> Probably more so, actually. Um, right, hi Roger. I've been trying to get my Phalaenopsis to bloom. However, all I grow is new roots and leaves. What am I missing? Well, first of all, you're growing roots and leaves. Don't knock it. Some people's just die. <laughs> <laughs> and some people lose more leaves than they gain and their plant just gets smaller and weaker all the time. So your plant sounds like it's doing okay. Two things with Phalaenopsis, they're classed as shade lovers. Yeah, no, <laughs> not in the UK. You can try a bit more light, yeah? Don't go mad and don't do a dramatic change. Don't take it from your dining room table in the middle of the room and put it on the brightest windowsill you've got. It, no, just a gradual change, a bit more light. The other thing that will trigger spikes on Phalaenopsis, I'm told, I can't prove it because I haven't actually done it yet, is a drop in temperature, more specifically a drop in the night temperature, making the gap between the night temperature and the day temperature bigger. See what I'm getting at? So a couple of things to try there. Uh, Moriko74. Hi Roger, at what temp humidity are you growing your Masdevallias? I'm in South Florida and I'm afraid I have made a terrible mistake by purchasing one. <laughs> oh dear. Best temp I can do is 70 to 75 Fahrenheit and I haven't got a clue what that is. I don't do Fahrenheit. I live in the modern world I'm afraid and 50 to 60 percent humidity. At least that's universal. Um, right, temperatures in here, there is a heater on a thermostat um, with a circulating fan attached, but that's irrelevant. And that thermostat is set to 16. That's, it's there summer and winter. It's there permanently. It's there for any time that that night temperature drops off of 16. So the way my thermostat works is as soon as it leaves 16, it kicks the heater on. Which means it's actually, it's not 15, is it? It's 15.99999, it's just under 16. And then as soon as it leaves 16 at the top, which is 16.0001, it shuts off. So 16 is my low night temperature. And when I got up this morning at silly o'clock, just getting light, the heater was on. So despite it being the middle of summer, the heater was required to maintain this at 16 degrees last night. I may be dropping that down a degree or two this winter because of the cost. We shall see. So that's my night temperature. My day temperature since I moved from the old grow room to this grow room very rarely exceed 26 degrees centigrade. Yep, so that's my daytime max. Um, it's gone up to 27 once and I opened the door and the window and it went down to 25 in about three minutes. So I have the ability to introduce cooler air. Circulating fan on all the time. You need airflow for orchids, even though it's off at the moment while I waffle. Um, yeah, so those are my temperature ranges. The humidity in here, my humidifier is set on a humidistat to 75%. Um, percent. Um, and it doesn't come on as often, anywhere near as often as it used to in the other place. It hasn't been on at all yet today, but that means it's above that naturally. And the reason that humidity stays quite high in here is because it's pretty well sealed and the air can't escape. Yeah? And in addition to that, I'm using a sprayer on my mounts every day at the moment, because, you know, summertime, growing season. And a lot of that drips on the floor. So there's natural humidity evaporating from the plants and the mounts, and I do have a lot of mounts in here. And when I'm spraying them, I miss, as some of it goes up the glass, you know, some of it. So there's naturally quite a high humidity in here. It seems to retain the humidity quite well. Um, at the moment, it's about 
and the temperature is currently 21, 22 degrees. Um, so there you go. Um, your problem with Florida will be heat. Um, so shade, airflow, good humidity. Um, that's all I can recommend. Some Maz Mazda Valleys are pretty tolerant of not getting everything their own way and they'll still do reasonably well. And others will just keel over. They just won't, you know, they won't progress. They'll slowly go downhill. So that's that. Right, what is my favourite dendrobium, favourite cattleya type and favourite oncidium? Simple answer to that is I haven't got any. If I had favourites, then the best thing I could do would be just have three orchids, wouldn't it? Not bother with the rest. You're not my favourite. I don't like you much. I like all my orchids for different reasons. Now, when somebody asks about my favourite orchid, normally they're talking about blooms. Because I like some orchids because of the way they grow and how they grow. And like how vigorous they are. Um, right, Oncidium type, I'm glad you put type on the end of that, I'm going to say it's actually my uh, one of my Miltonias. And again, this is not just blooms, this is the plant. Um, now some people think that um, Oncidium types look scruffy. Well, at the end of the day they do drop their older leaves, and as they drop they go yellow. You know, that, that's, that's how they grow. Um, but what I like about this one is on this growth here, last year's, that bloomed, it's grown two new ones. Both of them have a spike. Round here, one has gone into two. Both are in spike. Yeah? Another one here, in spike. So what I like about this is its vigour. I like the fact that it can expand into a pretty big plant pretty rapidly. Um, and the blooms are gorgeous. Um, that's a uh, it's a Miltonia hybrid that's based on Moreliana um, that used to be Miltonia spectabilis variety Moreliana um, but it's now been given its species in its own right but that's not the true species that's got something else lurking in there which has given it its vigour and increased the size and number of the blooms so they've added something in there and I think what it possibly is, is, is Moreliana, it was the start point, it's been crossed with a very vigorous hybrid of some sort, with larger blooms but of similar colour so that they don't mess the colours up, and then it's probably been crossed back again with Moreliana, but that can only be a guess. So that would be my favourite Oncidium type. Um, uh, favourite Dendrogum is, is, well, it always has been, I can't see that this getting taken away from me and it's basically um, a lot of people wouldn't choose it because they think it's a scruffy plant this is Hercoglossum that's the reason it's my favourite those blooms are just gorgeous and I'm pointing that at the camera now so that you can see them but that's not how you need to view these as you can see they all hang downwards they point to the ground and the way to view this is to look up at it, so that the light's above it. And it looks, at, those blooms look absolutely gorgeous when they're in that position, and you're underneath and you look up. So, favourite dendrobium, Perco Blossom. Has, it has been since I got it, and there's nothing actually come in yet that's actually taken over. My favourite Catlia type um, would have been Lelia purpurata, Variety Atropurpurea, but I've lost it, so I can't. It was my favourite while I had it, but that, that got hit hard with the root issue. Um, so, what's replaced it now? I've still got a Lelia purpurata, Variety Striata, but that's not my favourite. It, it was my second choice as far as Lelias were concerned. I'd say my favourite now is the one with the silly long name that is my only red Catlia apart from. Catlia cernua, but um, this is it, um, and it's got a long name, it's Siang Yu Red Pearl, and it's variety Red Dragonfly, it's red, <laughs> and it has cluster type flowers on, a good number of them, 
and at the moment it's actually doing some growing. It's got a new growth pushing up in the middle of the plant and uh, yeah, and another new growth starting around here. So we will get blooms on that later down the line. Although that suffered from the root issue, it didn't suffer as bad as some of the others. So it, it's pulled back um, quicker than some of the others. And uh, that, there we go. So that's my favourite cat at the moment. I suppose you could include, in addition to that, um, which probably could override that red one. So the red one is a cat leer, rather than just a cat leer type. But it's on a par, possibly overridden by Lelia anseps, which is still one that stops me dead when I see it in bloom. Um, yeah, possibly Lelia anseps. Right, so there we go, some choices. What else did we... was that all? Uh, I've lost where I am. What question was that? Caliotype, dendrobium, lancidia. Yep, right, that was that then. Next one down. Tina tries life. It was a good idea because the alternative's not so funny, is it? Um, right, what orchid type family would you recommend for a next purchase after Phalaenopsis for a home grower who would like to expand their collection? Right. Um, some medium to miniature cattleyas that are single leaf. Don't get the ones that are, um, that are pairs of leaves. They're, they're more finicky at repotting time and they're, they're just more finicky. Bifoliate, sorry. So get the ones with single leaf pseudo bulbs. There are some nice miniatures and medium size, ones that won't take up the whole house because some of the cattleyas are pretty big. Um, they're not bad, they're quite tolerant of lower humidity, but they do need good light, so you need a bright position, yeah? So, if you've got the ability to give them the light, they're not a bad choice. They're pretty easy going, you know, they need to dry in between watering, the same as your Phalaenopsis. They just need the brighter light. Um, other things, you could try... Um, nobly type Dendrobium hybrids. Um, normally sold as a mass of blooms. The problem with them is they're, they're very tall canes, a lot of them. There are some smaller versions out there, but they tend to grow pretty tall and they fall over a lot, <laughs> unless you've got them. The ideal set of circumstances is to keep them in a relatively small pot, because then you don't overwater them, um, and then put that pot inside something that won't fall over you know, so, uh, like something with a weighted bottom, with gravel in the bottom or something, um, because they do grow pretty tall. Um, yeah, uh, they're pretty easy going. They don't need the ridiculously high humidity that some orchids need. Um, they do need a little bit of um, seasonal care. Um, the, they normally bloom late winter, early spring, and they need what's called a winter rest, to the best of your ability. The hybrids don't need to be precise, but you need to Preferably keep them in a cooler, brighter room for the winter and almost forget about them, quite honestly. <laughs> give them a trickle of water now and again to stop them shriveling. But try and give them brighter light in the winter than you did in the summer. They don't need the bright light in the growing season. And also a cooler temperature if possible. Um, and if you can't do that, they'll probably bloom anyway, just not perhaps as well. Yeah. So that's that. Right. I have a Dendrobium Hancockii, which is mounted and is really too big for a mount. Well, yes, I mean, I had one of those. It was on the floor and it was still up here. I, I nicknamed it the bamboo bush because it looked like a bamboo bush. They do grow big and they can grow bigger than you've got yours now because yours is probably a bit restricted being on a mount. If you get it in perhaps better environment, better circumstances, it could double in size. <laughs> they can grow big. Um, uh, right, so uh, I remember you had one potted, so I thought I'd pop mine. The problem is that all the canes will be at an odd angle if I pot it up. Will they ever straighten up? No. Um, if you've got your base of your plant on your mount like that and the canes come out and do that, then that's what they're going to do. They're not going to straighten up. 
but you might find you, you can try playing you know, keep the mount still and try seeing how far they'll move because once you turn it over and you put it in its pot they might stake to get them more upright and obviously new growths will come up in an upright position and then flop over and branch out all over the place it's a bit of a rampant thing that one um, yeah so you can keep it mounted um, there's no reason I can always put it on a bigger mount you know um, or what some people would do if they didn't want to do the root disturbance is strap your current mount on a bigger mount so that its roots can expand further but um, if it grows to its full size on a mount you're going to need somewhere pretty high to place the mount they grow big they can grow big right um, I have two well, hang on <laughs> I'm just, uh, sorry I didn't say who that was did I that was Ned Flynn sorry but, sorry Ned <laughs> right next one is Serrara, Serrara, yeah Serrara I think that is, um, I have two, how often do you water your dendrobiums on mounts, I presume that means you have two dendrobiums on mounts, and the other one, what's the temperature and humidity in your greenhouse, I've already done that but I can quickly do it again, minimum night of 16 degrees C, daytime temperatures in the growing season <coughs> around 24, 25, 26 ish, um, and my humidity minimum is 75% and it usually sits around 80. It can go up to 85, 90 overnight. So that's that. Um, how often do I water my dendrobiums on mounts? This time of year, if I get a dull day, like today's quite a cool day, there's no sun, it's completely overcast. And they got a good soak yesterday lunchtime, so they won't get watered today, they'll get left. Um, but in better weather when the temperatures, you know, as I said, it's only 21, 22 degrees in here. It's not exactly warm. Um, but on a warmer day when that temperature goes up every day during the growing season. In the winter, that might come down to every fourth or fifth day. And that will depend on weather. It used to depend, in the other grow room, on whether the sun came out. Because even in the winter, if the sun came out and hit that glass... I got a good daytime temperature out of it, which I didn't really want in the winter. I won't ever get that here. The sun only ever hits half of the roof, and it's going to do that for about three months of the year, and then it'll be gone. And without the sun hitting any of the sides or the roof, I'm not going to get excessive temperatures in here. So I'm not going to get any, get any help at all with my heating in the winter. <laughs> right, that's that. Right, Patricia Bronk, is there, is there our circum, <laughs> are there any circumstances that you would add a feeding of extra nitrogen to your orchids? Describe, I use a balanced fertiliser with nitrogen in it. Well, yes, or nothing much is going to grow without nitrogen. Um, I use that. That is calcium nitrate. Um, that is a good heavy boost of nitrogen only to be used on plants that are growing. There's no point in giving extra nitrogen to plants that aren't growing. They won't use it. Yeah? Um, but the fact that it's calcium nitrate, it's also backed up with calcium because if you're going to start chucking nitro ni extra nitrogen into your plants and taking it away from a balanced level, where your N and your K should be similar and your P somewhat lower, just different. Um, so if your N and your K are roughly the same, which they ought to be, you're going to bump that nitrogen up. You're going to start pushing extra growth into the plant. And that growth can be very floppy and sappy and leaves will kink. So by using that, you put the calcium in there as well at the same time. That gives the cells their strength. I also use CalMag, which has got some nitrogen in it, but that's more of a boost for the calcium, magnesium and some um, iron. But there is a little bit of nitrogen in there, which would bump up the current level of my normal feed. And my normal feed, the nitrogen level is a little bit below the K. I think it's 13 compared to 15. And then the P value is about 5 or 6, I think that's quite relatively low. So yes, I do add calcium nitrate 
I'll do a normal feed, I'll do a feed with CalMag and I'll do a feed with the calcium nitrate in the growing season and somewhere in there there'll be a flush and I don't do it religiously ticking things off on the calendar I do it how I feel yeah so there's no strict rules right Gail Cunningham what is your favorite orchid <laughs> we've just done that well you had three um, uh, it's difficult to say because I, I've got orchids that I like because of their because of the plant and I've also got orchids that I like because of the blooms and out of the corner of my eye I'll get it out we've got a new bloom that's just opened because this was once one of my all-time favorites and this is Dendrobium harveyanum what about that then? Look at the frills on the sepals and the lip and that gorgeous daffodil yellow. That used to be one of my all-time favourites and probably still is. I just haven't seen that for so long, I'd forgotten. And when they first open, the centre of the lip has got a green tinge to it. So, ow! I just tripped over the rack. Um, well, kicked it actually. Um, so I, I can't say I've got a favourite orchid because I haven't. I've got different ones I like for different reasons. Um, some of it's blooms, some of it's plants. Some of it is because it's a real finicky thing to try and grow and I've got one growing quite well. So I've defeated its fussiness if you see what I mean. <laughs> then it dies. <laughs> Uh, so no, not really. And the other part of that question is, are you going to plant the buddleia in the ground so less watering? No, because I haven't got ground. I've got gravel beds that have a membrane underneath and they don't belong to me. So it'll stay in a pot. It's going in a big pot so that it doesn't blow over. Because the one I've got, um, and thanks for the contribution, the one I've got is going to get into a big bush. It's not one of the little dwarf ones, little ornamental ones, it's a big thing. It's currently got, hang on, it's currently in bloom, oh a fragrance, good, so it's, it's now that big, it was half that size when I got it, so it's growing well and it's currently in bloom all over the place and it needs to go in a big pot, it's going to be a big bush. Senior now. Uh, right, right, next. This, how long has this video been going? Whew, need to get a move on. Right, the next one is Squeaky35. Do you use a bloom booster, fertilizer, or just a typical equal MPK? Well, I don't use bloom boosters, I don't use growth boosters, but actually I do. I don't use a bloom booster. A bloom booster is basically an imbalanced fertilizer for a specific point in a plant's growth. And why I say it's an imbalance, you know, I've, I've just talked about the N and the K being roughly the same. Well, a bloom booster could be an increase in the K or just a reduction in the N, which is a far cheaper version. Something like a tomato feed would be a bloom booster because there's hardly any nitrogen in there. You want fruit and blooms and stuff. But quite honestly, again, I go back to plants in the wild. Mother Nature doesn't change the feed for a specific point in a plant's life because the plant over there might not be at that point. They get what they're given. And um, my balanced feed, which it is when I use it as it is, without any additives, as I said, the nitrogen's a bit less than the K value and the P's about half. Um, it's also got calcium magnesium in a reasonable quantity. It's also got all the trace elements. It's got everything my plants need in its basic form. But in the growing season, I like to give them a bit of a kick um, so they get that calcium uh, nitrate as a kick and then I readdress the balance by adding some cow mag in. 
Calcium and magnesium are not absorbed across the pH range very well. So they work best at a certain pH value. And when, you're, when you've got general plants all over the place, some are in older media, some are in new media, some are on mounts, some are in moss, some are bare rooted, the pH is all over the place. So by adding some extra calcium and magnesium in, the more of it there is, the better the chance of enough going into the plants. So that's my concept there. Right. Oh. Morica, Mauricio, 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 probably, 74. Um, hi Roger, just another quick comment. I just purchased D. Primulinum variety Laos. Mine also has shortish canes. It's not actually a question, it's a statement, but it warrants a little comment. When I bought mine, it was a relatively young plant and it hadn't bloomed. And when I got it home and I looked at the size of the canes, I thought, I've been diddled, this is not the real thing, this is a con. And I began to get annoyed because I was about, you know, and then some buds came. And when it opened, it was the real thing. And it seems that some grow quite large canes, and I'd say most don't. So there's some variety in the size of the plant. Mine is, my canes are quite small. I mean, it might change. I mean, that's the size of mine. That's not large canes. I've seen this particular variety of primulinum with canes three times that length. It's still the same plant. But I've now got two nice strong new growths coming. I wonder how big they'll get. Keep accusing it of having short canes. It's still a young plant. It's only just bloomed for the first time. So let's see what it does with its latest two canes. But yes, mine's got short canes and I've seen others with short canes. Right, where are we now? Well, we've got a flipping essay now. Um, Ninny Tech 62. My new seedling Miltoniopsis. <laughs> Good luck with that. Has developed rot. Mm -hmm. A black splodge in its pseudo bulbs. This is only the second one I've bought, and the same thing happened to the first, and it died last year. Miltoniopsis are not the easiest of orchids to grow. Um, Miltonias are, but not Miltoniopsis. They're often sold as one and the same thing. The rot just starts halfway up both the pseudo bulbs, it doesn't start from the base and the roots and leaves are fine. What am I doing wrong? Why do Miltoniopsis hate me? Well, they've hated me as well, and zygos. Um, I've had trouble with them over the whole life. Uh, you know, I've tried, the, I love the blooms, so I keep trying them. I've managed to get a few to grow now, including some species, um, but they're not easy. I make sure not to get the plant wet when I water it's potted in mainly bark and a small bit of sphagnum. It's winter here. Is there a way to save it? Rot on a Miltoniopsis, unless it's a bacterial or fungal infection, which is the least likely, quite honestly, um, if you're not getting the plant wet, is the possibility that your humidity is too high for the amount of airflow you've got, if any, open-ended question. Miltoniopsis come from cloud forests. They've got constant air movement. Moist air, cool moist air, constantly moving. Yeah? So that's their ideal world. How far away from that ideal world are you? And therein possibly lies the question. Um, if they're not rotting from the base to upwards, it's more likely to be the air, the environmental air that they're in. Now, as I said, unless it's a, a, an actual infection, um, which if your second one never saw the first one because it died, it won't have transferred across. That's unlikely, unless it's a, unless it's a place that's just supplying bad plants. But... Um, Strange, it sounded like the whole conservatory was going to collapse. <laughs> um, right, 
Because it's a small plant, there are only two pseudo bulbs, so it doesn't have any reserves. So I would love to be able to grow one successfully, read more. Hang on, we've got to expand the box here. I'll say another sentence. But obviously I'm doing something wrong. Any points for a Miltoniopsis murderer? Well, the best advice I can give, which might not be what you want, is don't buy young plants. Get a mature one that's got a good root system and you've got a much better chance of holding on to that than something like that. I mean, that's a hybrid, grows massive blooms, and I mean, that's, that pushed up six new growths and five of them have bloomed. Um, it's a strong plant, it's a vigorous plant, it's produced a good root system, yeah? So try and aim for, to, to get something like that as your starting point. I mean, quite honestly, I'd probably have a job to kill that now, but then, you know, some of my species are not, not doing anywhere near as well as that. But that's my best advice with Miltoniopsis, if you have trouble with them, is get a nice mature plant that's got new growths coming and you can see that it's got a good root system. And, oh, I mean, I can show you what I would class as an almost miserable failure just to show that I don't grow them all well. This one has a rotten pseudo bulb with mould growing on it, followed by a weak pseudo bulb with a leaf that's about to fall off. It's got virtually no roots and it's got two new growths. Those new growths are its only hope, but the whole of the rest of the plant has already failed. And it, that part of the plant may take down the new growths and I'll lose it. So this one's doing the hanging on by a thread. I can now see new roots coming out at the base of those new growths. It's time to get it out of that soggy moss and get it into something that um, will be more suitable. But no, I don't grow, I don't grow them all well. <laughs> I mean, here's another one that's, um, this one failed and, and recovered. This was bought at the same time as the other one. This one had the same treatment, just chuck it in moss and see what it does. And it's got rot near the base of some of the plant, but it, this one's coming back into life now. We've got two new growths here and a stronger new growth pushing on here that has got roots. So again, that needs coming out of the moss now and going in something that stays moist but not soggy like the moss does. This is very coarse grade moss, so it's not, there's still air in there, it's not compacted or anything. So, no, not all my Miltoniopsis are doing well. Ah. Right, where do we get to? Insa has left a, no, he hasn't left a question, he's left a statement. No silly questions. Well, no silly questions isn't a question, so you're not going to get a silly answer, are you? <laughs> I've always said there are no silly questions, but there can be silly answers. So you're not getting one because you didn't ask a silly question. Right, that's that one. Um, Mandy4009, how is the best way to get mealy bugs or some kind of sticky white stuff off my phalaenopsis? Um, initially, if your plant's healthy, yeah, I would suggest 70% um, rubbing alcohol and some cotton wool cotton buds, yeah? And just physically remove everything yeah with the alcohol yeah initially and then do it again and then do it again until they stop and they should stop relatively quickly if it's mealybugs um, all you're doing really is you're getting rid of everything you can see leaving what you can't see in places that you haven't done the business you know and, and they'll hatch they'll be in the form of eggs or tiny little things you get them next time round until there are no more. So that, that's, that's the easiest and probably cheapest way to do it. Systemic insecticide will get rid of them, but that does need the whole plant treating. Top side of leaves, bottom side of leaves, preferably try and get some in at the root base as well. Um, but it takes time to work, it takes time to get throughout the plant. Most systemics are contact killers as well. So by doing that, you've just killed most of the adults and most of what's there anyway. And then the stuff that works systemically will stop them coming back. Um, uh, 
But yeah, the rubbing alcohol with the cotton wool buds is, is good for getting everything off that you can see. And then, as I said, repeat when you see something to, to deal with. <laughs> I remember a film once, I forget what it was. <laughs> when do we start shooting? When you can see something to shoot at. <laughs> I forget what the hell that was. That was donkey's years ago. Now, there's a film quiz for you. Where does that line come from? I've just remembered. <laughs> uh, right, the orchid saga. There are so many plants to grow, why do you choose growing mainly orchids? Um, it's a fascination that I can't get from other plants. Um, I used to grow a lot of fuchsias. I had about 40 different types of fuchsias. What does a fuchsia bloom look like? Now you've got different colours, different top bit, different trumpet bit. Yeah, you've got long thin ones and you've got short wider ones, but they basically all have four little curly up bits and a bit hanging down. The variety's not there. You can get ones with golden leaves, ones with dark green leaves, one with serrated leaf edges, but they're basically a bush. Variety's not there. Um, and the fascination with the orchids is simply they are there are more there are more orchid species than virtually any other plant on the planet except for grasses so it has the widest variety from the tops of trees down all the bits of the trees onto the rocks onto the forest floor um, you know the only place there aren't any orchids is the desert and, and the ice caps <laughs> uh, yeah permanently snow covered. So they grow in the most places and they have the most variety and some of the blooms are just stunning. They really are. So that's my reasoning. It's the variety, the different shapes and sizes of plants, their different growing environments and trying to keep all that in one environment is the fascination for me. Trying not to kill them. <laughs> Right, Gail Cunningham, you've already had one. Um, my bobcat may flower after all. One bud is starting to open. Is it okay to miss the buds? Well, I'd make an outright statement and say no. Um, I try and keep my plants dry, even in here, where I'm going round with a sprayer. I still try and miss the plant. I try and keep my plants dry with no water on them at all. Now, if I was growing in the home, a gentle misting in the morning, so it's got time to dry off, is not a bad idea. And it helps with the humidity, you know, and all that sort of thing. But um, there is always a danger that water can collect somewhere. Wherever water collects and is still, bacteria can form. And then you can get that damaging your leaf joints and things so um, I would say no don't get don't get the buds wet not even with a gentle mist try and avoid the buds as you're misting I don't, I don't, I'm not saying don't mist I'm just saying try and avoid your buds I don't think it's a good idea um, right and that was the last one so how long did that go on for probably too long oh I don't know Oh God, it's so difficult to work out where the flipping time is. Oh, there it is. Mm, nearly an hour. Still, so be it. We don't do them very often. I think it was six weeks ago we did the last one. Hope you've enjoyed that. There should be, quite honestly, with the variety of questions that have come up today, there should be something for everybody in there. Um, and hopefully the answers are in such a form that, that they make sense, if you see what I mean. And um, we'll have another go at another time. So thanks for dropping by, thanks for your time putting the questions in in the first place. Yeah, Without those we have no video. So uh, thanks for that, thanks for the support of the channel which this is part of. You, you, your questions on that video created a video for me and gave me a chance to chat about these topics and things so you helped make this video in fact. And so thanks for that and see you next time. Thanks for dropping by. <laughs>